All right, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to get things started uh, for us today. Um, thank you for joining us for this professional learning workshop information session. My name is Cassie, and I work at the Climate School, and I'm joined by a couple of colleagues today um, who are all going to be involved in um, the climate projections and modeling uh, workshop that we are offering this fall semester. Um, I will turn it over to them briefly to get us uh, going on the content and to share a little bit with you um, what uh, they have planned for everybody this fall. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our professional learning program a little bit, the Climate School, um, and give you all a sense of um, what to expect in, in this particular format of, of workshop. Um, so we started doing these professional learning workshops um, probably two academic years ago now, um, and we're excited to continue offering them online. Um, for those of you who may not know, the Climate School is the first new school at Columbia University in 25 years. Um, and it's really a wonderful opportunity, an exciting opportunity for us to um, come together around an extremely important issue and to bring together uh, various disciplines um, and departments and experts um, across the university um, and leverage their strengths and work towards this very important challenge that we are all facing. Um, for professional learning programs, we um, these are non-credit professional learning workshops, um, meaning that they are zero credit. Um, all participants receive a what we call a certificate of participation at the end of the workshop. Um, the all of uh, the professional learning workshops are online um, and are meant to. Um, uh, fit flexible schedules, which is why they're offered um, typically weeknight evenings. Um, our instructors for these workshops are the exact same instructors who actually teach in our academic programs. So we offer, um, it's the same level of quality and rigor across um, all, our, all our offerings. These are all 15 hour workshops in length um, and they're um, over several weeks uh, in the fall semester. Um, and once you are done with the workshop, up, you are done. Um, and there is no uh, assigned sort of assignments or mandatory homework and readings. Often the instructors will make suggestions for additional readings. Um, and often uh, students um, can also and participants can also reach out to instructors for office hours should there be questions about content and so on. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the lead instructor for the workshop, um, Simon Mason, and he is going to go over some slides um, with the with uh, that'll help you get a sense of what to expect content wise for the workshop. Um, and just a quick reminder, we're keeping an eye on the Q&A box today. Uh, participants won't be able to use the chat box, um, so please put any questions that you might have um, in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be sure to address those. All right, Simon, take it away. Thank you, Casey. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining and uh, at least showing this level of interest in, in joining our, our course. I, uh, I'd like to give a brief uh, overview of uh, what we plan to uh, present. There's still a little bit of uh, flexibility to, to shape things based on, on any questions. Um, but just an outline of what I'll uh, talk about uh, in the next few minutes. I'll give a little bit of background to um, the course that we're planning to present, um, introduce you to the instructors. There'll be uh, two of us from Columbia, and we've got a great uh, guest lecturer from the University of Miami. Um, I'll talk briefly about what we're hoping you will learn from the course and give you a brief uh, uh, outline of the tentative schedule of each of the sessions. But I wanted to start off just with a little game. So imagine that we have a set of hail forecasts. And let's assume that on average, it hails three times per year. And we have some forecasts. And the forecast is right 99% of the time. 
So the, <clears throat> the problem you have is do you take protective steps? Okay, you're going to decide that you will take protective steps if the chance of hail exceeds 50% and no if the chance of hail is less than 50%. The forecast predicts hail tomorrow. Should you take protective steps? I'll let you think about that whilst I give a bit of background for the course. So there's a, a, a few quotes that I pulled out that I think provide uh, some motivation for why I'm uh, or why we're interested to present this course. So the one is from uh, Patrick Young, who says the trouble with weather forecasting is that it's right too often for us to ignore it and wrong too often for us to rely on it. And so what we want to do in this course is to give you some indication of why forecasts are wrong as often as they are, but Let's be a little bit skeptical about this assumption. Our forecasts actually as wrong as, uh, as, as we, we sense they are. And so we'll, we'll be addressing both these questions, looking at why sometimes forecasts don't work, looking at why it's actually uh, so difficult to make forecasts, but also looking at why forecasts often appear um, <coughs> less accurate than they really are and looking at issues of uh, uh, correct interpretation of the forecast. Sometimes the forecasts are considered to be wrong because they are uh, improperly understood. The next quote is from the famous uh, late astronomer, Stephen Hawking. There is no way we can predict the weather six months ahead beyond giving the seasonal average. Well, I've spent my last 30 years plus doing uh, exactly the opposite. Um, but it's a very reasonable question to ask, how can we presume to predict more than a few days in advance if the weather forecasts uh, become hopelessly inaccurate um, after about 10 days or two weeks? One thing you'll uh, learn in this course, if you don't already know, is that it's essentially impossible to predict the weather uh, accurately beyond about 10 days to two weeks. So how can we presume to be able to forecast be, beyond that uh, range? And we look at, we look at uh, why it is possible to predict further into the future. And <clears throat> we will also look at um, uh, what forecasts are available at these longer lead times, looking a few weeks to a few years into advance. And we'll ask the question, how good or how, how bad are these forecasts? My third quote, the old rule of forecasting was to make as many forecasts as possible and publicize the ones you got right. The new rule is to forecast so far into the future that no one will know you got it wrong. And this is very much uh, an issue of concern when we're trying to make uh, forecasts many years in advance and is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, climate skeptics are, um, <coughs> are unconvinced by some of the projections that we are producing for later on this century. And so we'll have a, a session on looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the climate models and asking the question, you know, what can we actually believe, given that we have imperfect models, what can we say confidently about the more distant future? And my fourth, I think this is my final quote, the goal of forecasting is not to predict the future, but to tell you what you need to know to take meaningful action in the present. And so we will also include in this um, workshop a session on how do we actually go from predicting the weather and the climate into predicting things that we actually care about. For example, how do we <coughs> make predictions about uh, possible health uh, outcomes 
um, or, or flooding, for example. So where, where are we coming from in, in presenting this course? Well, the, the, the two main presenters from Colombia are both part of a group called the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, which we just abbreviate to the IRI. And we've got over 25 years of experience producing forecasts for the next few months and more recently for the next few weeks. We also are engaged in trying to uh, work on forecasts for uh, <clears throat> many years into the future. We've uh, performed extensive training for of, of uh, forecasters um, from national centers, so people who are making uh, official forecasts for their country. We've trained many of these forecasters around the world, and we've also um, been engaged extensively in trying to translate forecasts into um, some actual action, not just putting a forecast out there. So who are the course instructors? Well, myself, I'm the chief climate scientist at the IRI, and I'm also a professor at uh, Columbia's uh, uh, climate school, where I currently teach the statistical analysis of climate data. I've also taught climate dynamics and climate risk. I've done a course on climate and health, and I've trained meteorologists from over 150 countries around the world in forecasting and services. My uh, areas of uh, expertise, obviously, in forecasting. I'm also uh, an expert on what's called, and apologize for the jargon, forecast verification. And this is essentially um, asking the question, how good or how bad are forecasts? Uh, I have an award from the World Meteorological Organization for services to um, uh, climatology. And let me uh, pass the baton to uh, Angel Munoz. Uh, are you online, Angel? He's going to be uh, yes, a here. joint presenter with you. Oh, well, so thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here um, with Ben and, and with Simon. We will hear about Ben in, in a second. Um, and uh, very nice to meet you all. Um, I guess we will have a little more time later. So I am an associate research scientist at the IRI, and um, you know, following the same structure as uh, that Simon just presented, I've been teaching uh, on climate diagnostics. Like, if you want, you can say that that is uh, on mechanisms and prediction, what we also call climate dynamics, climate risk, and climate and health and migration. And um, I have been uh, actually trained. I was a PhD here at Columbia University. I was trained by. Uh, Simon and, and others on forecasting and climate models and uh, the interaction, the physical interaction between different climate phenomena like El Nino and a few others that we will be seeing in these classes. Um, and also obviously on climate services, which is something that we all do at the IRI. And uh, I recently got this um, award from the Spanish Ministry of Science. It's, it's called a Ramon y Cajal Fellowship. Uh, that um, is providing uh, funding and fun for the next five years. Thank you all, and thank you, Simon. Thank you, Angel. And we're also very lucky to have as a guest uh, lecturer um, Ben Kirkman from the University of Miami. Uh, ben, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So um, I'm a professor at the University of Miami, and uh, uh, I have a, some other leadership roles there that are described. Uh, primarily, I teach courses on um, uh, climate dynamics, atmospheric dynamics, uh, everything you wanted to know about El Nino and were afraid to ask. Uh, those are the kinds of courses I teach. Um, my expertise is in is in climate modeling and uh, trying to understand the limits of how far we can predict into the future. So as Simon has already talked a little bit about, you know, I get uh, phone calls from people saying, you know, I'm getting married on June 27th and they want to know if it's going to rain and because uh, they want to have an outdoor wedding and that's beyond the limit of predictability. But what can we predict? 
about the next June is something I think about a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I have a few awards uh, uh, noted there. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. So what are we going to try to communicate uh, in this course? Um, so I've listed uh, five major uh, objectives or, or uh, achievements that you'll hopefully realize. So we hope you'll understand how forecasts are made and why forecasts for different timescales are possible given this uh, question that we've raised already today about the fact that we can't forecast the weather beyond a few days. <clears throat> so given these forecasts at uh, timescales, we look at everything from um, a, a few hours to a few centuries in advance. How good are the, are the forecasts at these different timescales? And what can and cannot be predicted? And perhaps most importantly, how to, how to interpret the different forecasts that are available correctly. So our tentative schedule is we're going to be starting um, on October the 27th. These dates are, are fixed, but the, the topics may get adjusted a little bit. Um, there'll be two, two uh, uh, most of them will be two hours and 10 minutes sessions. The first session on October the 27th will be uh, two hours. So in that session, we'll just provide an, uh, an introduction to why forecasting is difficult. How is it that we can't predict the weather beyond a few days? And we'll look at different types of forecasts. Uh, the next session, uh, each year, or one week later, we'll look at some principles of forecasting, uh, including general approaches, um, so looking at, uh, at different ways in which forecasts can be made um, statistical and uh, uh, using physics-based models, for example. <clears throat> we'll talk about how do we measure how good or bad uh, forecasts are. And then we'll start to look at um, in more detail how forecasts are made at different time scales. So we'll start uh, looking at forecasts uh, hours to weeks in advance. We'll take a break on Thanksgiving since these are Thursdays. Uh, and then the following week, we'll have uh, Ben talk about what, uh, what climate models can and can't do and uh, why, why we might be able to believe them given that they are imperfect. Um, then we'll look at uh, forecasting at months and beyond. And finally, we'll look at the forecasting the impacts. So just to come back to this uh, uh, hail forecast game. Um, so the answer is that given this information with a 99% accurate forecast, the probability of hail actually occurring is only 45%. And so you shouldn't take protective steps. We're not going to go into the um, detailed mathematics of this, but uh, I did want to bring across the issue that um, without a correct understanding of forecast information, we can often make bad decisions. And so we will try to um, communicate to you how to interpret forecast correctly. So that's my introduction. We're happy to try and field any questions uh, about the course. Um, uh, my, uh, I, will, I will try and uh, answer questions about content uh, with calling on Angel and Ben uh, as needed. If you have some questions about uh, uh, logistics, uh, uh, et cetera, then um, from my colleagues from the Climate School will uh, attempt to answer those. So thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Simon. Um, so we'd like to take this opportunity uh, for everyone who's here to um, share and ask any questions um, that they might have about the workshops. Um, I forgot to mention a very important detail earlier, which is that everything will be recorded and participants will actually have access to um, content and recordings um, for up to a year after the workshop ends. Um, we have fees associated with the workshop uh, for this academic year. Um, reduced rates are available for current students, uh, Columbia University alumni, those working in government NGO sectors. Um, and so if you have any questions about um, those options, please feel free to email us. Um, I will put the uh, our email address, um, group email address in the link and someone will get back to you shortly. Um, there is a registration deadline for the workshop, um, which is two weeks before the, the start date. Um, so I'm gonna look at the, there's some questions. Yes, this is all online. Um, I'll take this one and then I'm going to have uh, Simon take the next one, which is about an understanding of statistics. Um, everything will be online. It will all be via Zoom. Um, we will likely be using a uh, platform at Columbia um, that's uh, that instructors have used for our degree programs um, and what this allows us to do is for instructors to post notes and uh, suggested readings for participants to have discussions um, and just makes things a lot easier. But the main platform for all the sessions will be Zoom. So Simon, if you want to take Kevin's yes, question thank here. Thank you, Kessie. So how much is an understanding of statistics necessary? Um, so we're going to make the course as uh, maths and statistics free as possible um, obviously we won't be able to complete the um uh, we won't be able to cut out all uh, all maths and statistics there'll be some uh, a few very simple equations but uh, i would say you know if you know what an average is um then <laughs> not much more would be needed to 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 get uh, uh, good information out of the course. If there are some uh, statistical or mathematical or physics concepts that uh, we feel are essential to understand things properly, we will um, make an effort to, uh, to explain those carefully. But this course will be much more of a, uh, trying to communicate a conceptual understanding of what is possible and how things work um, rather than requiring any advanced degrees in, in maths or physics. Fantastic. Very important question as well as answer here. Um, we are just about out of time. So if there's any additional questions, um, my colleague Laurel has just put our group email in the chat. Um, if you do have any questions after the session, feel free to email us there. We'll be sharing a copy of the info session um, with all of you after uh, we are done here. Um, and if you do have anything that comes up, feel free to, to contact us. Um, before we wrap up, um, Simon, Ben, on hell, are there any last uh, comments you'd like to make to the to folks who are here? Not on my side, just uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Same here, nothing to add. Indeed, thank you. Please sign up. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks to our presenters here. Um, and we look forward to, to hopefully seeing you in the workshop. All right, have a great rest of your evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.